very impressed with uh, the three speakers that came before me. Um, and I mean, they're all great scientists and great speakers, but I think what, what really struck me was the change that uh, the focus of individuals' talks have, have been over the last decade. And, uh, it, you know, this is the first time I've heard a panel of speakers all talk about the practicality of developing treatments. Um, and really considering all of the, the, the most pragmatic and appropriate issues, which is very, very different than it was 10 years ago, where scientists talked about moving, you know, doing science and translational science that ended basically with doing clinical trials. And there wasn't much overlap between scientists and clinical trials. And uh, the basic scientists in the field of spinal cord injury then didn't understand at all very well clinical trials and the, the rest of the process. And you know, there certainly were some that did because they participated in it. But what you're seeing is uh, a much larger group now understanding this. And, and, and uh, it's largely a reflection of the very rapid movement forward and the push towards treatments. And it's really, really happening. So it is. I was impressed. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, changing concept, concepts in CNS repair. And I'm going to highlight a few of the things that multiple speakers talked about today. Um, and then I'm going to highlight this concept of activity based restoration therapies from molecular mechanisms to clinical application. And, you know, I'd like to say that, um, you know, I, I may still be considered controversial, but I used to definitely be considered controversial, uh, which was a good thing, which because it usually was also synonymous with being young. I feel much older now. And, um, um, but, you know, I knew the path that we were going down was the right path because I had seen the evidence, you know, but it does take years to push things through uh, scientifically and do the studies and do those sorts of things. Um, but, uh, Suffice it to say that it's amazing what you can do by taking advantage of the body's own ability to self-repair for the purpose of micro-regeneration. Not regeneration where you're getting axons to grow a centimeter down the cord, not where you're getting whole tissues to form, but all we need, this is the take-home message, all we need for the majority of people living with spinal cord injury Right? And the majority, the vast majority, that means over 80% of those living with injuries, including all the AJs and the completes, all they need is micro repair in order to basically return to close to normal function. All right? So who believes that? I'm still controversial. It's true. Um, so first I'd like to talk about this concept of optimizing spontaneous regeneration and recovery. And all the speakers really spoke to this point, but I want to emphasize it a few things. That is, yesterday's principles, um, and, and this applies to this activity-based restoration therapy, okay? That yesterday's principles and techniques of rehabilitation today apply with differences in time, space, and rationale. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about are these ABRT or activity-based restoration therapies are the same tools and techniques that we're, we've been using for years in rehabilitation. What we've done is combined modern science and technology to do it more effectively and efficiently. It enables us to do it at home and track all those individuals from all over the world uh, through Bluetooth technology. And um, to do it in a more time-efficient and cost-effective manner where you can demonstrate quantitative um, outcome measures that um, are objective and can be all obtained at home. The, therefore, um, you know, they're the same, similar and the same techniques, but they're being done for a different reason, and they're being applied in a different time period. We're focusing on people living with injury. So I'm most interested in that quarter of a million to a half million people living with traumatic and non-traumatic spinal cord injury in the United States, all of them. Yeah. We're only here for a short amount of time in, um, in this world, and you know, uh, I, 
you know, I went and you know applied for the combined MD PhD because the, the U.S. government was interested in getting scientists trained to, in medicine. So I spent a, the first 30 years of my life in school. I'm only here for a short amount of time, and I want to do what's going to affect the most amount of people to the greatest degree, and something that is going to be required for everything. Um, and I think we have that, or at least the tip of the icebergs here. Um, so this therapy is done different in time. That is, we focus on chronic injury, not acute injury. Right? And one of the big issues in the field is that as things are so rapidly progressed, they kind of outstripped the medical system. And as you know, the medical system is largely focused on everything up until the day you get discharged at home. But once you're in that post-acute rehabilitation phase, it's sayonara, you know? I mean, there's not much out there. Because it doesn't mean that people don't want to help, and physicians don't want to help. But they, they can't help, because they're in a system that's designed to do acute care. So this is a much bigger issue or problem. Um, that needs to be addressed. So we're focused on chronic, in the chronic phase. It's equally applicable in the acute phase. We're also focused in a different space. That um, we're, we're interested in providing pragmatic therapies. One of the biggest barriers to provision or development of a treatment has nothing to do with the science. The science is necessary so, 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 so far from special. If you don't get reimbursement, if people can't use it, and it doesn't apply to the majority of individuals, it will never become a pragmatic treatment, guaranteed. So we focused on this activity-based therapy being pr provided in the home. And it needs to be provided in the home in less than you know six hours a week because that's the most that an individual with paralysis can, can actually put in. Some can do more, but on average, that's it. And it needs to be done without any other caregivers. You know, it needs to be done in a turnkey operation where they can use it in their same, their same you know, setting as they're normally in. And it you know, needs to cost basically cents a day you know, over, over, over time. And um, it needs to be pragmatic. It, it needs to be, you press a button and it goes. It does everything. And then it's even better if, if, if it allows your medical system to monitor it. Okay, but still, even that's not done. You know, you, you, you gotta get long-term reimbursement. And there's many factors that play in that. You know, um, Gold standard clinical trials is, is just one. But as you know, in the field of spinal cord injury, or in any field where there's relatively small numbers, the spinal cord injury is, um, is, there will never be gold standards in many areas. They'll only be focused in a few. One of the major reasons that clinical trials aren't being done as quickly as we'd all like, is just money. It's just money. I know, I mean, I could fill this room with scientists that would begin a clinical trial tomorrow they were given their 10 to 20 million dollars required to do that. Um, so there's a lot of practical barriers, but you know, I, I knew that if we were gonna apply a technique that had to be delivered um, like Prozac over the lifetime of an individual, but through a rehabilitative technique,